This is the 12th video in the video series of Orbital Mechanics of Python. This one, I'm going to talk about aerodynamic drag. Um, so we're going to get an acceleration equation out of this. This is another perturbation, so we need basically that acceleration equation. Um, so I have this source here from NASA. Um, basically, aerodynamic drag. Um, this is obviously an airplane example, but it's the exact same thing for a spacecraft. What you have is d is your drag is equal to cd, which is a coefficient of drag. I'll talk more about that later, how it relates to spacecraft. Uh, density, which is the density of the air. Um, that you're flying through, V and your velocity, which is actually velocity relative to the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is rotating, so I'll show you how to implement that, but it's not just a still thing in the inertial frame. Um, you square that, and then you have your reference area, um, whatever area that you have of your spacecraft in the direction of your relative velocity, and then divide by two. And in this equation, this is the drag force, so you're going to divide by mass to get the drag acceleration. And it's worth mentioning, Earth's atmosphere is extremely complex. Um, yeah, I mean, there's just no way to get around it. It's an incredibly complex thing. It's actually super interesting. And one of the things that it's highly dependent on is the solar cycle, 11-year um, cycle. I'll post a link to that as well, because it's actually just very interesting how the solar cycle actually affects the atmosphere. Um, but a way to model it is the U.S. Southern Atmosphere of 1976. Um, it's pretty old, but I don't know. It still works. I mean, it's still the atmosphere hasn't changed that much in, what, 40, 50 years. Um, the most important thing to take away from this is that as the altitude increases, the pressure exponentially goes to zero. Um, and that's the whole point. The higher up you go, the atmosphere is exponentially decreasing in density. That's why airplanes like to go very high because the air, the drag is low. Um, and obviously the spacecraft, it's very thin, but it still will deorbit you in a certain amount of time. And that's what we're going to get to. Um, rotation of atmosphere, as I said, um, the atmosphere is not fixed in the inertial frame. It's rotating with the rotation of the Earth. Um, so you have to account for that in order to get more accurate um, simulations. And then I just want to show real quick, because the ISS is in low Earth orbit, so it does have to have boosts. And it usually does it from visiting spacecraft. So a, if a spacecraft comes and um, delivers a bunch of cargo, sometimes it will also give it a boost if it's the right spacecraft for that. Um, so you can see here, uh, say, this is 2014, 2015. Um, you see a little boost here and there. They let it go for a while, for a few months, give a little boost. It really just depends on what they're doing, but the whole point is that um, the ISS is in low Earth orbit, so it does need boosts every once in a while. So get to the software. Um, get that out of there. Okay, so I have an example I had from a homework a while back. Um, uh, it was originally 100 kilograms, but I just decreased it to 10, so you can see the effects really quick. Um, this is for three days. I'm just trying to show you the effects, basically. Um, so coefficient of drag, if you don't know what it is, you assume 2.2 because obviously spacecraft aren't built to be aerodynamically um, kind of efficient. Airplanes are, but spacecraft are not because the atmosphere is so thin. So this is actually very high. If, and if an aircraft had this, there'd be a huge problem. Um, area is just some arbitrary area. Um, this is all arbitrary numbers, obviously. I, I just chose these numbers to kind of show you what kind of effect the aerodynamic drag perturbation has on a spacecraft. Um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is some... Um, just equations to find some major axis, you take perigee and apogee, you divide by two, and this is how you find the eccentricity if you have perigee and apogee. Um, just a simple equations. Uh, but what I really want to get to is actually showing you what's going on. Let's open up the uh, Python tools, orbit propagator. Uh, ignore all these extra values. Um, I said I switched computers, so I have a bunch of stuff that's already there. But um, this is what's really important. Um, so just like the other one, it's oblateness. I might have called it J2 in the last video, I can't remember. But I switched computers, so I kind of jumbled everything around. But, um, just like that, you want to go ahead and assert arrow, um, which is what was here. Uh, perts arrow equals true. You just want to get that to true. Um, so how you do this is you first want to calculate what your altitude is. So it's going to be the norm of your radial vector, um, which you have here, minus whatever central body radius you have. It's only Earth, really. I haven't modeled anything outside of Earth as far as atmosphere. I'm sure there's Mars atmosphere as model somewhere. Um, I'll get to this uh, function in a second, but rho is just the air density. So you have your altitude, and then you want to find the air density at that altitude. Um, high level first, and I'm going to go deeper into the functions, but just so you know what's going on here. Um, and then you want to calculate the motion of the spacecraft with respect to the rotating atmosphere, like I said. So V is your velocity in the Earth-centered inertial frame. Um, and you from that, you want to subtract 
uh, how the atmosphere is moving, it, which is dependent on how far away you are or where you are relative to the atmosphere. So you're just going to take the cross product between those two, where this ATM rotation vector um, is in the units of radians per second. That's just how Earth is rotating. Um, and you want to make sure it's radians per second. Um, yeah, so you just calculate that. And so that's how you get your velocity relative to the rotating atmosphere. And then from that, you can plug in the equation that I showed before, which I'll pull up here real quick. Which is here. Uh, we have your, so start out with negative because it is the, the acceleration is opposite of your velocity vector because it's slowing you down. So, so V rel here is a vector. And then I have the norm of it as well here because it's squared. So this vector has one uh, kind of magnitude of it and you square it like that. 0 0.5 divided by 2, rho, this is the air density. Um, the perturbations you pass in has a coefficient of drag, the area, and then the mass, which I'll, I'll get to how to plug it in in a second. But um, that's that. You add it to the total acceleration vector just like this. Um, I didn't have to make a new variable. That was for debugging purposes, but um, yeah. And then you just pass it straight through. Just like any other perturbation, that's how it works. So to get to these functions, so how do you calculate that atmospheric density? Um, we'll go to the tools file. Find rho z. So um, what, how you model this, the 1976 model, is I have these three data points. You can have more data points if you want, but it doesn't really give you that much difference. Um, where 63 kilometers, 251 kilometers, and 1,000 kilometers of altitude. And then at each one of those altitudes is the density of the air where that is. Obviously, you can see that the air is just barely existing in 1,000 kilometers. Um, so what I have here is I just have a Z's value in the planetary data dictionary, which is just 63, 251, 1,000, and then the rows, um, which I multiply times 10 to the eighth because they need to be in kilograms per kilometer cubed um, units. Um, pretty simple there. And then what you do with those is you're going to exponentially, you're going to interpolate with an exponential function in between them. So the first thing you do here is rho z's, find rho z, is this function that I have. Um, it's saying if it's not within one kilometer, a thousand kilometers, just assume that the atmosphere is zero. And this is just a fail safe because you're never going to be orbiting at one kilometer of Earth. Like, that's just not what you do. Um, it's just a fail safe here. Obviously, usually um, spacecraft are kind of determined as deorbited when you get to 100 kilometers because the atmosphere will bring them down. Um, so, that, that's just there for those types of reasons. And if it's above 1,000, just call it zero and just have it be whatever. It's just zero. There's basically no atmosphere up there. And then. What this is doing is finding which two, this is kind of like a complicated logic for it because this can account for like any arbitrary number of data points, but I only have three. So in reality, I could have wrote this a lot simpler, but this logic just kind of picks out which two of these, um, basically which two, oh, get that out of there. Which two of these um, altitude values are you within basically? So I got a lot of stuff here. Um, so say you had an altitude of 100 kilometers, you'd be in between the 63 and the 251. That's all that's doing, is just picking those values. So it's kind of a roundabout way of doing that, but um, it was just for the logic sense, if you can have an arbitrary amount of data points, basically. And if it's out of range, just return zeros. I think that already covers that, but that's just the way I have it. Um, so yeah, so then if rows equals zero, then return zero, there's no density. And this is kind of, uh, these two lines are kind of just interpolating between two data points using an exponential function. Uh, I'll probably just post a link to that because I don't really want to explain it, but it's just it's just kind of just math. I don't know how else to say it. Um, orbit propagator. Yeah, I think that pretty much explains what's going on there. Um, so as we go through this, some arbitrary state vector, and then, oh, I actually have a few uh, functions that I added um, for this. Well, I already had them, but I'm adding them for your sake. Oh, and then... Um, Passing in mass zero, uh, where I defined it as 10 kilograms. Again, this is just super arbitrary. I'm just trying to show you the effects of the aerodynamic drag without making it be like a three-month propagation. Um, so plot alts, uh, plot your um, altitude over time. Uh, it's pretty self-explanatory because of all the other functions. It's basically just a copy and paste from the plotting of other functions, just with different basic values. Um, I'll get to that one in a sec. The plot apple apps, periaps, I'll get to that one. 
Um, plot alts. Did I already calculate? Okay, yeah. So I already calculated alt in the propagate orbit, probably. Okay, yeah. So this is all you have to do for the calculate your altitude over time. So the norm function mp dot linal dot norm um, axis equals one. It's uh, instead of doing a for loop and calculating for each um, r vector in this self dot r's array, calculate the norm. You can actually just do that with this command and. Um, just the way they wrote it, it runs like 10 times faster, so you're going to want to use that. Axis equals zero means um, along the all the columns, so the all of the first column gets normed together, all the second column, but in this one, um, all of the rows get normed together. Um, so that's what that's doing, and you're going to subtract the radius because you want to find the altitude of that. And reshape to self uh, and one is for other purposes that I'll get to in another video. Um, but it's basically, it, it's a vector because it's just... Uh, uh, however many rows by one column array, but in NumPy, it's different than just having, not having this one will actually give you a different result um, where I, it's very useful to have this one in some other functions that I'll get to at some other point. But that's just why I have like that, and that's why it's dot reshape. Um, yeah, so you calculate the altitudes, and then from that, you just plot them. Basically, all these arguments are the same as any other plotting function. Um, like, literally, probably all the same. Um, so... I don't think this altitude is, yeah, this isn't used. I don't know why. Oh, because sometimes you want to plot center major axis or something, but um, that's fine. Um, yeah, literally the same as before. If hours, days, whatever, seconds, blah, blah, blah. Super simple. And then I have uh, calculate Apple apps, peri apps, and then plot Apple apps, peri apps, which is calculate Apple apps, peri apps. I'll post a link to a video, but basically since the... Uh, Apple apps and peri apps. Uh, peri apps, your true anomaly is zero, and uh, Apple apps, your true anomaly is 180. So that obviously um, simplifies the functions with sines and cosines. Um, so it's super easy um, to calculate. This is this is your um, semi major axis, uh, self dot co is zero, um, one plus, and this is eccentricity basically. Um, super simple equation. I'll, I'll post the link because I don't want to drive it. And again, the same thing as before, just plot Apple apps, peri apps, literally all the same values. It's super simple. Copy and paste a lot of the stuff. T's, stuff on Apple apps, blah, blah, blah. So with this, so basically what's going to happen here is you're going to plot the altitudes, uh, plot the 3D trajectory, which you're not going to see much, obviously. Um, calculate the codes, plot the codes, calculate Apple apps, peri apps, plot Apple apps, peri apps. So I already ran it a few times, so I know it's going to work most likely. Let's see what other videos I have coming up. Could the oceans clean up interceptor? I don't know. Can it? Jeez. Right, that might not go away. I've got a lot of videos to watch. So basically running this. Um, yeah, my computer's real hot. I honestly have to get a new computer. It's getting real slow nowadays. Nope. I hope you're enjoying all my YouTube notifications. There we go. All right, why is this taking so long? All the imports taking a while, okay. Again, this won't run this slow on your computer. I guarantee you that. Mine's getting pretty old, I gotta get a new one. I got done with the orbits propagating. Okay, so as you can see, um, it will oscillate because I set this to not be a circular orbit. Um, it's, yeah, just not circular. Um, so it'll oscillate, but you can see it's trending downward. So obviously this spacecraft is in the process of deorbiting. And then let's see the next one. Obviously, you're not going to see much in this plot because I said the Earth radius is huge, and only noticing like 20 kilometers is it's you're not going to see it in a plot like that. Calculate plot cos. Um, so this is what you want to see. Basically, um, your semi major axis is going to decrease pretty rapidly over time, and again, this slope is getting larger because of the fact that the lower you go, the density is getting thicker exponentially. Just like when it was exponentially getting less, okay, thinner. As you're going up, same thing going down. So the more you're deorbiting, the more that's going to accelerate. Um, and you can see also your eccentricity is decreasing over time because your apogee and perigee are getting closer to, to each other, and which will be shown in the next plot. Um, you can see 
the blue is your Apple apps or Apogee in this case, um, is trending down towards your Perigee or Peri apps. So that's, that's what's going to happen. And eventually they're going to meet. And then once they meet, they'll just go straight down, which means your spacecraft is deorbited. And yeah, that's about it for this one. That's kind of what I wanted to show you guys. Uh, which one is it here? So in the next video, geez, my computer kind of sucks. Um, oh, actually, I have to talk about the changes because uh, I was going to go through NASA Spice Files, which I guess I'll talk about. Um, the very high fidelity uh, ephemeris data. Basically, um, NASA has this file where it can it predicts the position and velocity of every planet and a lot of moons, um, and is valid from 1950 to 2050, and it's all in one file. Um, they're called spice files, is what they call them. Um, so you can get very accurate, like you can depend on NASA to know where things are going to be. Um, so you can use them for third body perturbations and solar radiation pressure. But actually, before this, I guess let's edit this now. Um, someone asked me, um, one of the followers, to do um, the low thrust trajectory. So I was like, okay, sure. Um, so low thrust, which is what I'm going to do next. Um, so low thrust, basically, uh, in the electric engines are much more popular nowadays, but the thrust is on the scale from, say, millinewtons to micronewtons. Um, so kind of like how you raise your orbit or even deorbit, because sometimes you want to deorbit to not to create uh, create space debris. Um, so I'm going to be covering that next. I basically do it as a um, another perturbation, which is kind of how I build it in, where you pass in your values of ISP and thrust, and then your mass is going to change over time. So what I put in the mass in this um, video that is constant, in this one, it's going to be, you're going to add it as a state variable, but it's going to change over time. Um, so you need a differential equation, basically a derivative of how your mass is changing over time, which I'll totally cover in the next one, so that's going to be next. And then after that, I'll do the spice files because from the spice files, I'll then be able to do third body perturbations and solar radiation pressure. So, yeah, that's it for this one. Um, let me know if you have any comments, anything too fast or slow, like always. And, yeah, thank you for watching.